Hey y'all, thought I'd show you once again our red bubble masks. This is the Windwalker mask. I've been wearing it for a couple months now. It's uh, it's great because it has the Windwalker, see? And his cold breath will keep away the, uh, the virus, I'm sure. Okay, so now if you are playing a horror campaign, such as Sandy Peterson's Cthulhu Mythos, we have several campaigns out now. We have uh, Ghoul Island, we have Yig Snake Granddaddy, Dark Worlds is coming up. So if you're playing in this, in this fantasy universe, you're playing D&D &D or Pathfinder, right? You have a different challenge than Call of Cthulhu. You see, in Call of Cthulhu, all magic can be creepy and scary. But in D&D, &D, there's lots of kinds of magic, and most of them aren't scary at all. In Call of Cthulhu, if you have someone hypnotizing and controlling you from a distance, like Count Dracula, that's terrifying. But in D&D, &D, that's just, you know, a control person spell. In Call of Cthulhu, if a creepy scaled monster scrapes its way into your house, you're petrified. But again, in D&D, you're trying to figure out, look through the manual, is it a wyvern or just a giant lizard? So how do you scare people who have magic swords and spells and familiarity with unnatural weird monsters? Well, I use three tricks to pull this off. First, one of the main characteristics of any magic game is that the magic is codified. Now, in Call of Cthulhu, the magic isn't really very well codified. That's intentional, right? Now, in D&D, &D, you know exactly which spells you can cast and how many of each level. If the bad guys violate this rule, you know they're unnatural. If you have low-level cultists, first or second level, whatever you have in D&D, &D, and they're shooting fingers of death, something's wrong. Also, it seems really unfair and horrible to players. This is good because if and when they can defeat the bad guys, they'll really like it. Now, let me give you an example of how we warp the universe and violate this in Sandy Peter's Cthulhu Mythos. One of the enemies we have in it, naturally enough, is is this guy. He start, his name starts with an H. And the way this entity violates reality is that it violates perspective. For example, normally, if you're looking at someone who's far away and you hold your hands like this over his head, you can see, oh, look, his head's only an inch apart because, you know, perspective, right? You can do it right now to be on the TV screen, see how big my head looks. Now, imagine that you're doing this and you're seeing that thing that starts with an H, the thing that he who is not to be named, and you put your hand over him because he's a few hundred feet off, and you squeeze with him, you can feel him because he's there with you. He violates perspective. He's always there. That's why when you say his name, you notice I'm avoiding doing, he can sometimes manifest because if Aldebaran is above the, high, the horizon, he's physically there, although many light years away, too tiny to see. It also means that if you have multiple people all looking at him, they each have their own manifestation separately. When he gets closer, he gets bigger, further, far away, but it, like it's violating the laws of reality in a way that nothing else does in D&D or Pathfinder, and it's absolutely terrifying. So there's two ways of making the bad guys seem unfair and cheating. Low of guys using good spells, demons that violate the laws of the universe, uh, uh, interspatial ge uh, geography. There's lots of these things in my books, but that's some ideas that you can keep at your back of your mind. You're trying to scare players who have magic. Suddenly these guys are doing magic at a level beyond what you even dreamed was possible. Okay, next, let's go to the next thing. A core principle of Lovecraft is that the main horrors are just on the surface. There's more lurking beneath, often much more. Behind the cultist is a priest. Behind the priest are the deep ones. Behind the deep ones are the star spawn. Behind the star spawn is great Cthulhu. This means that Ultimately, the players are always outpowered. They can never truly and forever defeat the bad guys. Oh, goberfish! Big goberfish! It's always a bigger fish. This is just as true if they have magic items as if they don't. Now, one major difference between a fantasy universe and the modern Call of Cthulhu setting is that in a fantasy game like D&D, &D, your players are much more likely to instinctively try to solve things by combat instead of by investigating. You can handle this in two ways. Bearing in mind that you have monsters up your sleeve that are stronger than anything they can beat. You can either let them fight it out 
and like they might get spanked if they pull their swords and try to stab a Shargoth, or you can encourage them to find another way. Now, if you let them fight it out, you need to make it clear when they have no chance to succeed so they can run away, at least some of them. You aren't, you aren't really doing this just to kill off your players. But if they choose to investigate, remember, you're playing D&D. It's okay for them to fight once in a while. It's good for their soul. So remember, the core features of horror remain the same regardless of setting. Even with magic and people that like to fight, you always have a bigger fish and the rules are being violated. So there's also other core features of the game. I've got links here to two other uh, videos I did about, about using horror in the games. And this applies as much to Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder as to anything else. So. Have fun in our doomed universe infested by horrors beyond our imagination.